Hi, I'm Darren Mortimer, Technical Analyst with Geosoft, and today I'm going to show you a typical workflow of working with geophysical data, as well as some of the new features coming in version 7.1, both for people working with geophysical data, and if you're also just working with maps and uh, databases as well. So here I have a, a database of some airborne magnetic data that I've imported into ACES, and I'm a visual kind of guy. I like to look at pictures rather than just a long stream of numbers. So to be able to look at a profile of this map, I can just right click on the channel of data or the column of data that I'd like to see the profile with and say show profile. And there's a profile of my, my raw data. Now I can also go and click on my leveled data, right click again, say show profile. And now I'm displaying two profiles onto my database. If I'd like to see these right now, these two profiles have two different y-axes. But if I'd like to be able to compare them, it'd be better if they had the same y-axis values. So in the y in the panel, I'm going to right mouse click and say y-axis options. And here this is one of the new features in version 7.1 that we've improved the readability of this tool, making it easier for the irregular users or the new users using the uh, profile tool. And for this, I'm going to choose the same Y profile scale and the same axis scale for all profiles. And there we can see that both the profiles, we can see with each of those levels. I can also easily move between lines and see the, the different lines in, in, the, in my database. One of the new tools that we have in version 7.1 is an iterative leveling tool. And leveling, as you're not familiar with it, is a removal of systematic noise within the data. This can be caused by directions in the aircraft's flying direction, slight variations in the altitude as well, and they can create noise, which you can see in this map here that I've got on the lower right of the screen. Between each line, you see sort of a corrugated or a rippled effect. And leveling is the is a process where we match the control or tie lines to our survey lines. And this is a very iterative and repetitive process. To make this easier, we've created the iterative leveling tool. Here I can specify my input and my output data, but now also I can specify the number of iterations that I would like the tool to automatically run through. At each iteration, it will tell me what my standard error is, and I have the choice of whether you've been able to proceed, if I'd like to try to improve that error, or to accept it as it stands. For the save time here, I've already run the tool, and I'll just go and load up a view. And then I've used a, a working view to be able to show and display that leveling data. The working views, if you're not familiar with them, they're a quick way, if you've got different channels that you've got profiled or even displayed or turned on, to be able to save and be able to come back and alternate between different views of your data, making it easier rather than you have to go through each time hiding or displaying or setting the colors for a particular data channel. And here we can look at the data for the cross difference in, in blue, which is the, the difference between where the tie line or the control line matched that individual survey line at that point. And I can open up here a map that will show me the level data. And you can see this level data is much easier to interpret. We don't see any of those systematic um, errors anymore. One of the unique features of Oasis Montage is the ability to use data linking. Here I can go turn on my data linking cursor. Now wherever I click on my map, my cursor will go to that same location in my database, in my database profiles, and also on any other map that I'm using. So I can go and click on this anomaly down here, and you can see that how my cursor is tracked to that same point in all of my maps and my database windows. Now that I've leveled my data, and I'd like to be able to look at this some more, perhaps do some transformations of the data, or do some filtering on my grids, I can go and use our MagMap interactive filtering tool. The interactive tool requires that I do a couple steps in preparation. I've already gone and done these ahead of time to save us some time today. And I can go right into the interactive spectrum filter. And here it's displaying a, a radially averaged 
power spectrum. The power spectrum is the area of the volume under your data. And I can go and create various filters in here. And I can choose, for example, a bandpass filter and eliminate certain wavelengths from my data. And in fact, one of the new and improved features of version 7.1 is that this graph of the power spectrum has now has wavelength displayed along the bottom. Previously, it was wave number, and everybody had to do that inversion in their head of 1 over the wavelength to get what wave number that they had spit. Now I can go in and set my wavelength that I'd like to display. I can actually even change the number on the graph here so that for the information that I'm more interested in on the left-hand side of the graph, where all the action is, if you would, I can zoom into that portion of the graph if I would like to. Now, because as I mentioned earlier, I'm a, a visual kind of guy, I can hit the preview button and see an actual preview of the data. Why don't we try using a upward continuation to remove some subtle uh, or high frequency noise out of the data and uh, to clean it up a little bit. So I'll choose a value for my upward continuation. I can also stack several filters. So once I've removed and filtered some of the noise out of the data, I could go on to, say, for example, calculate a vertical derivative to help enhance some of the the edges or visualizing the bodies within the data. I can choose here whether to simply by moving the sliders for each of these tools, whether I'd like to do, for example, a first or a second vertical derivative. So why don't we do a first vertical derivative today? There I can see the effects of that on the previewed graphs. To also help us with some time, I've pre-run ahead of that. And there's the, what the results of running the the first vertical derivative with the upward continuation filter would give me. Making it much easier to see things like linear trends within the data. How often have you been given a grid and wondered what that was all about? Where did the data come from? What was it made of? What was run? What was the process used to create that grid? Here I can come over onto my grids in my Project Explorer, right mouse click, and look at the metadata for that grid. Here I can open up my metadata for the grid, and I can see things like the description of the grid. If I had gone and entered one, some uh, a paragraph I could enter in about the data. And I also can scroll down to the lineage. And the lineage is essentially a history of the processes that were being read on this grid or was used to create this grid data set. Now here again, I have, I have my map with the, the, the level data on. And if I'd like to import some claim boundaries onto this map, I have a shapefile. Now when I was provided with a shapefile, I was told that it was in NAND83 zone 18 and using an ESRI transform number 12. I don't know what an ESRI transform number 12 is, but that's the information I've got. I can look at my map and if I look down here on my lower right area of the screen, I can see there that my map happens to be in WGS84 UTM zone 18. So what's going to happen when I import that data? So I'm going to go to Map, Import, and grab the import for the shapefile. And one of the first things that will come up when you're importing from a shapefile is the new dialog for dealing with the transforms from ESRI. Now I was told that this data was in ESRI transform number 12. So I'll click on the ESRI names and scroll up to the ESRI number, transform number 12. And I can now then click on the Geosoft name and see that in the name that I'm more familiar with, NAND27 Canada, New Brunswick, Newfoundland. So we'll click OK to that. Import my data. Here on my map, my claim boundaries have uh, come in and have been imported. To make it easy to see, I'll just turn off those grids that we had displayed earlier. In addition to being able to import the attribute values from the shape file, we can also import each of the individual vertices. Here is the table of the attribute values, and you can see when I click on each of those values for my two polygons or claim boundaries, it goes to a centroid of that polygon. Or I can go and click on my shapes, table that includes all the vertices, and when I move on those ones, 
that will move around each of the individual corners or vertices in the, this particular polygon. Now perhaps if we go back to my map and I've got all my grids and information turned on, and if I'd like to make a uh, map of one of these target areas or show you one of these target areas, where would you go and look? I could give you some coordinates, and again, they're being displayed in the bottom right, but they're kind of cumbersome for you to go and find those coordinates on the map. So to make it easier, I could save myself a snapshot. And I've got to save a couple snapshots on my map. So on my map, I do a right mouse click, and I can see I can quickly go and look at some of those snapshots, and they zoom me into a specific area of my map. So here we have a snapshot of an area that we might like to make a sub-map of, or another map. And again, before, you had to do this by going and finding what the vertices are, what the coordinates would be of your map area. New to version 7.1 is the ability to go into the new map and create a new map from an XYZ. And we have an interactive button now. But by clicking on the interactive button, I can go onto an existing map, click and draw a rectangle that I would like to use as my map boundary. And those values will then be populated into the, the data range for the map. And I simply go as before, next, and create a new map from the already existing map. So here now I have my, my blank map. I can go onto my map, quickly throw myself a, a little base map on there. Won't worry about the title on, on here today. Now if I wanted to start putting some data on there, I could come into my Project Explorer, grab one of my grids, and drag and drop it onto my map. A little shortcut for being able to display the data. I could also come onto my already existing map, and from the View Group Manager, I could grab one of the grids there and drag and drop that and display it onto my map as well. Now I've got to display the level of data on to, onto the map. I might want to adjust the color. So I've got an opened our color image tool. I can go and load from an existing color table. Now, if anybody's been doing this before, you remember how many clicks you had to go through to go and find your existing color table that you had saved in your project workspace, because the tool would by default go to the color table folder in your install. Now we've added a button here to go directly to your working directory or to your project folder. So I can click on that choose my zone file that I had created earlier, and apply that custom color palette to my map. I could go on to also, is adjusting the, the color shading on this map using the interactive shadow tool, and as I move a sun around, the sun illuminates the surface of the data, making it very easy to identify subtle trends or lineations within the, the data itself. There we go, we can apply a custom color tool and adjust the, the angle of the ink illumination. So there's a quick run through of some of the new tools and a potential workflow working with geophysical data in Oasis Montage. To learn more about our new release, take a look at the What's New demo for Target, and we'll talk about the new features in our geology tools and our new 3D tool. You can also take a look at our new product, Geochemistry for ArcGIS.